Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Big Jiu-Jitsu Show. And before we get to our interview with Joshua Cooksley, what I wanted to do was go over some of our sponsors, talk a little bit about them. First off, I want to thank Trap and Roll Soap Company. Go check out Trap and Roll Soap Company for all your soap needs. It cleans you, and it is awesome soap. It's not just some bullshit I'm going to shoot at you. It is legitimately some of the best soap I've ever used in my life, and I feel super fucking clean after I use it. So please check them out. Veteran-owned company if you're into supporting vets starting up their own business. And uh, don't forget to check out Tape Armor. I know a lot of people are arguing over who has the best tape. Well, in my opinion, it's Tape Armor because I've used it for a good while now. And my fingers, you know, I used to get those old crinkled hands, like, you know, the old monkey claw looking type thing. My fingers are doing a lot better than they used to, so I'm really thankful for Tape Armor and their their product. It's really helped me out a lot. And I also wanted to thank PR Performance and Angry Joe Coffee. Those are two great companies you guys should support as well. Now we're going to be getting into our interview with Joshua Cook. So he is a third stripe or three stripe brown belt out of Sunshine Coast, Australia. Cool fucking dude. Has a really really good insight into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, even though he's kind of on the young side but who the fuck cares because guess what he's fucking knowledgeable and he loves the sport so i really do hope you enjoy this don't forget to go to bjjshow.com find some of our old episodes buy a shirt buy a patch and go to itunes subscribe and you know hook us up maybe with a five star or five star review we're really appreciative of it so hope you enjoy the interview and i will talk to you guys next time as well intro for <laughs> the podcast it's very good intro it's very good um Thank you. so I'm, I'm getting to sit here with joshua cooksley yo, a, yo. a brown belt out of infinity martial arts sun coast sunshine coast sunshine coast australia he's been uh he visited us yep. for one week but now another week as well next yep. week i was invited to stay and i've been getting cooked like three meals a day yeah. really really good traditional mexican meals and you can't say no to that no absolutely not no like you know it's out here in germany it's kind of a rare thing to find a good yeah quality mexican meal for uh yeah of course of course and like the hosts are fantastic jiu-jitsu is fantastic like the students are great do you know what i mean so i'm happy to be here yeah we were like super stoked to have you come into the gym and train us and i've learned a lot my my elbow is probably never going to be the same again after tonight's lesson so same (laughs) <laughs> Not after you arm locked it, you prick. My bad. <laughs> but uh, so, what brought you to Germany, to Europe, all this training? Because I met you because I didn't attend the Globe Trotter Camp. I went and visited Eva and Stephanie out there and uh, ran into you and yep. met you there. So, like, what brought you all the way out here? So, um, I've been training for a while in Australia, and uh, it reached a point where I sort of just got fed up with the training ethic of the Australian people, because Australians are very relaxed. They're very relaxed people. And I wanted to sort of train a bit harder than anyone in Australia was really willing to give. Or, like, don't get me wrong, there's heaps of people in Australia that would train hard, but, like, because it's so spread out, you'd have to train, like, travel an hour and a half, two hours away to get them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, like, three hours on the plane, sort of thing. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to come to Europe where there's, like, even better guys again, and a room full of them, and I could stay, like, 10 minutes walk away and come to a room full of 100 guys that are just better than I am and train hard. And uh, so I attended the Globetrotters camp and then I met Eva, you know, your your, your uh, co-pilot. Cohort. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, she invited me on over to Germany and I thought, well, that's a pretty cool opportunity. So here I am. Excellent. And you know what? That's, that's something. So when I went out, I actually got to go out with some of the group on Friday night and that kind of spoiled me. I was like, fuck, I got to get involved with these guys. You know, it's always been like a... <laughs> Like this, that past week of work, yep. they're like, you're going to be the only guy there really that's in charge. So I couldn't go and bum me out. But of course, especially after going Friday night, I sat down at work earlier this week because we came back on Monday. I was like, hey, um, do we have anything going on in January? And he says, no. Why? I was like, oh, I'm going to Vienna the first week. He's like, oh, okay. So I got it blocked off already. Yep. Well, before anybody else put any leave. But like you coming from the Globetrotters camp is you know, pretty solid group of people just to yeah, train yeah. with. Yeah, it was like 300 plus people and there wasn't 
anyone I rolled with that wasn't really good. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, hard rolls. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That said, Chad sort of put me in front of 200 of them and said, this is Josh, go smash the shit out of him. <laughs> so everyone was smashing the shit out of me. It was good. Good experience. Bit tired now, though. Um, so it's good to have a, a bit of a lighter week. Do you know what I mean? Not not training with some black belts every every day. Yeah. Um, uh, but the week after next, we'll go to Paris and get back into it. Excellent. So we have like up to the point now of where you've been in jiu-jitsu. Obviously brought you to Europe. Yep. Training in Australia. How did you even get started? Um, I've always wanted to do a martial arts. And this is going to sound so fucking dumb, but it's actually <laughs> the truth. <laughs> like, I, I've always wanted to do a martial arts, and mum always said no. And then I went and turned 18, yeah. and we moved down to the Sunshine Coast from Townsville, which is a fucking hole. Never go there. Never go there on holiday. Um, and I thought, well, I'm 18 now. I'm going to get started. I asked mum just for, you know, like, is it all right now that I'm an adult? And she said yes. So I said, cool. Googled martial arts sunshine coast and infinity martial arts popped up and it was 958 meters or something from my front door and uh so i walked in and i didn't care what it was and it turned out to be brazilian jiu-jitsu and very nice i thought it was like the weirdest thing i'd ever seen in my life and but i thought i'd give it a go yeah and i really enjoyed it and you know four or five years later here we are wow i was gonna say like that's that's one of the funny and most off-putting like it off puts a lot of people of course. To, uh, like, those guys are hugging each other and yeah. wearing pajamas and they're rolling on the ground. Like, that is the yeah. biggest thing. And, you know, it's it's really cool that you're at least open-minded enough to be like, who, who the fuck cares? Yeah, Like, of I'm going to take it, yeah. Of course. Like, I, my in my mind, the martial arts was always, like, the movies. Do you know what I mean? The yeah. traditional Eastern-style kung fu, uh, Bruce Lee, you know, uh, Wing Chun-type deal. And so it was a bit of a rude shock to learn that fights aren't actually beautiful choreographed affairs. They're actually brutal, scrappy, nasty things where people get their face scraped along the concrete and the people get hurt. And, uh, you know, it was a bit of a rude awakening to realize that you don't necessarily need a flashy Eastern... I'm going to annoy a lot of people here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you need more practicality yeah. in your fighting style, and fighting is very practical. So the more practical the style is, the better it is for you. Hence why, you know, I train jiu-jitsu and a little bit of Muay Thai and boxing and all the rest of it. And it's very, very practical movements. Um, and, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, all martial arts, in, in my opinion at least, all martial arts are effective. That's why they're a, a martial art. It's just Brazilian jiu-jitsu is the most effective because we get to actively train it all the time. Yeah. So in boxing, you might only get one week out of four of hard sparring where you get to actively train it. Same thing in Muay Thai. You can't do it all the time because you just get hurt. Whereas in Jiu-Jitsu, you do an hour of lesson and then for two or three hours, you'll go, okay, let's fight. And then for three hours, you'll just fight every single day. And because you've got no impact, no striking involved, you can train it to its fullest extent, hard, whilst being relatively safe. Yeah. And that, in my mind, is what makes jiu-jitsu more effective than any other martial art. If humans were resilient to the point where we could take hits to the head like it was nothing, um, then I'm sure most other martial arts would probably be better. No, I do agree to a point. But then again, you if it was just like straight up striking, right? Like you say, the human body is built to take whatever, right? Yep. Let's, let's do like hypothetical, you know, something got really awesome in our in our evolution and now we can take full force like trauma to the face and we yep. heal up a day later no brain damage whatsoever well i suppose in that case you just it would still be effective because you would need to be able to control the person that's true too like, like fighting a crackhead or something you'd be like fighting wolverine <laughs> <laughs> bites his tongue off and throws it at you now imagine one of those dudes on like pcp or something oh yeah <laughs> yes shoot them four times in the skull and they don't flinch yeah so actually that does you know what Fuck that question. It was a terrible question. Let's <laughs> let's retool it then. So like, so I think like if it was just all striking arts, let's say like grappling never existed, like okay. you know, it'd still be like some sort of like, oh, my style is better than yours because oh, of practical. course, one hundred percent that would that there would always be that because people get attached to things, don't they? They do. They intrinsically say my way is better, and so if I happen to stumble upon boxing instead of kickboxing, I'd say no, nah, be a purist, go boxing because yeah. like. 
the more you learn how to move, kicks don't matter because I'm better with my hands and you don't need kicks at that point. Whereas a kickboxer would say, well, kicks are really devastating. So you, you, you throw kicks in there and it hurts a lot and you'll do a lot of damage. My way is better. And then you've got a guy in Muay Thai that says, look, I do a slightly different variation of kickboxing. I throw elbows in as well and it's even better again. And then, you know, the boxing guy would say, well, elbows are useless if I stay outside of your range because of my footwork and my hands. And there'll always be that disparity. There'll always be like, no, my way is better. No, my way is better. It's just human nature. Yeah. 100%. Nobody wants to be wrong. Nobody no wants one to wants to be wrong. No one wants to... Well, not so much that. It's just no one wants to not be right. So, like, not necessarily any martial art is better or worse than each other. Um, it's just... Uh, like, no one wants to admit that another martial art may be better than theirs. Right. If okay. that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think it's kind of funny, like, you know, talking talking to another, you know, jujitsu practitioner as well. It's uh it's kind of funny because on the podcast before, like, you know, Devin or Sean and I hmm. we talk about some of the most like harshest, toughest, like just zealots for uh defending Brazilian Jiu Jitsu seem to be the new guys. Oh, one hundred percent. And and God bless them, you know, they yeah, like, dude, I'm, for sure. We've all been there. For sure. Well, it comes back to what I was just saying, doesn't it? Like, you stumble upon something and you get attached to it, don't yeah. you? Whereas when you've been doing it a while and you sort of get a bit more wisdom, if you will, behind you and a little bit more experience and life experience with dealing with people and seeing styles, you might come to the decision that, well, you know, a shoot for a double leg and get kneed in the face. Yeah. What happens then? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And 100% you're right. The new guys in every martial arts will always defend it the hardest. And <laughs> going back, so so what kind of what kind of hits me is um, your story with jiu-jitsu is very similar to my story with taekwondo. Like, okay. I was a kid and I was like, I want to do martial arts. And it was kind of a different story. My dad was like, well, son, we can't afford it, you know, because I'm from the <laughs> South. And I said, I'll show you, Dad. When I'm old enough to drive, I'll go do a martial art and I'll do taekwondo because I fucking saw it on TV. And yeah. It was uh, the best of the best, one of the greatest martial arts movies ever made, where it was a U.S. Taekwondo team versus a South Korean Taekwondo team. And I'm like, look at that. He almost killed him with Taekwondo. So in my mind, I'm like, I need to, I need to do Taekwondo. That's like the only thing I'm going to do. Yep. So same thing. Like, and yep, 100%. After a uh, jiu-jitsu guy put me on my back um, a few years after I did Taekwondo, I'm like, yeah, I probably need to do uh, jiu-jitsu. Yeah, for sure. I'm getting my ass beat. But it's just like... I was like, you know what? It's it's not a... Taekwondo is way more devastating. We totally could just front kick you and keep you away. I did a little wrestling. I totally could stop you. Yeah. And then, like I said, when the jiu-jitsu guy took me down, I was when I was like, you mm. probably need to try something else. Still love of Taekwondo. Course. Still love... Like, when I go home, I'll train with my sister and my brother-in-law. Of course. And But those well, days are over, man. Well, <laughs> again, that, that also comes back to what I was saying before, is how much did you actively spar Taekwondo? Like how every... Many- Every week, once Every a week, week, once a week, yeah. yeah, and for how long? An hour. An hour. Yeah. So one hour a week, fifty-two hours a year, you'd get fifty-two hours in like three weeks in jujitsu. You do. You so can. like, where is the point of overlap and increase? There needs to be a point of catch-up first and foremost, and a point of overlap in order for taekwondo to be more effective than jujitsu. Right. It's all well and good to say, I'm going to keep you away, I'm going to teep you, I'm going to knee you in the face, I'm going to like front kick you, I'm going to spinning heel kick you, and I'm going to knock you out before you get to shoot. And you know, that may be true, but if you don't actively practice that in a real life setting all the time, it's not useful to you. Right. And that's what I was saying before with jiu-jitsu, is because you're always practicing all the time in a real life setting for like two, three, sometimes four or five hours after class it becomes more effective just because you have more experience. And that's the only reason in my mind. It's not because the style is superior. It's because people can train it more. Yeah. And they do it in different, like, like you said, real life scenarios where they're hmm. getting in there. They're smart. Now, if, I, if you uh, did Taekwondo kind of like Muay Thai. Yeah. And then we train hard. We spar like every other day at that point. Like yep. Maybe there would be an increase. And there are some schools, I bet, that do do that already. Yeah, of course. Well, you, you look at the, the fights between like the bodybuilder and um, Hyen, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like way back when, Hoist maybe. Like he comes into the UFC and uh, the bodybuilder that has no classical martial arts 
experience at all. He takes him down, mounts him, can slaps him around a little bit, chokes him out really quickly. Yeah. And then he does the same thing against like a karate expert. I'm doing air bunnies here, like quote unquote karate <laughs> expert. Yeah. Um, and it takes him a little bit longer because the karate expert is throwing shots. Same sort of thing. Like if you if you put me up against a Muay Thai fighter purely, may or may not be able to close the distance. Depends on how good they are. Again, the Muay Thai fighters train hard, man. Like they they will actively spar all the time. They'll practice their front kicks. They'll practice kneeing. They'll practice elbows. They'll put pads on. They'll go, and they will not care if they get hurt. The objective is to hurt each other. They accept that and they go. It's a special type of person in my mind to do like hard striking sports. Um, you know, maybe I close the distance, maybe not. It's really up in the air. Uh, in my mind, though, it comes down to who's trained their martial arts more. Yeah. Again, and whether or not one person gets lucky. Because I'm still only human, aren't I? I still bleed red like the rest of you, and getting hit in the face still hurts. Just because I've been training five, six years doesn't mean I'm not immune <laughs> anymore. Right. Yeah. And the same thing goes for TIE Fighters. They're still human. You know, double leg them, drop them on the head, arm bar them from mount. Fight's over. So anyway, that's uh, that's my particular thoughts on the problem or no. <laughs> the question. Well, yeah, I mean, we kind of got into a roundabout way. I, I just love, like, it's always been like this, no matter what, you know, we, we talk about, this is a jiu-jitsu podcast. We still get an MMA occasionally. We get, like, weird stuff. Of course. As well. Not so much as those like Jiu-Jitsu After Dark guys. Great yeah, folks. Yeah, of course. Another, another good podcast. I'll give them a shout out because they're just straight stand-up dudes. And, yeah, of course. Um, but like, it does focus on, on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, you know, talking about style versus style or whatever. And I always, no matter what, I don't always think about UFC. I always think about blood sport. Yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Jean-Claude Van Damme does the splits and punches a big sumo in the nuts. Is yeah, that, exactly. That like, yeah. yeah, style versus style. You got everybody and whatever. But it's, you know, going from that and then realizing that my uh, a, a good fighting career is not me standing on some weird canvassed, like, ramp. Yep. With uh, a giant roided out Korean dude, like looking to kick my ass. Actually, I kind of want that to happen, but but do you really want that to happen? Bo Young would probably kill me if he hit me once. <laughs> hit me once, I'd die. But it's Is, are we talking about a deeper problem here? Do you need to see someone? A, a what? If you want that to happen, does that mean like you need to speak to someone about suicidal thoughts or maybe like if you like wanting it. that to happen? I don't know. Like, if he's hitting you once and you want that to happen to you, is what I'm saying. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, like, I want to stand there and be like, this is really happening. And then oh, he comes okay. at me and be like, fuck, this is really <laughs> happening. You know, just the attitude would definitely change. Yeah, but, okay. Like, like the, the realization that you may actually die. Yeah, then like... that's completely, yeah, completely different than the fact, like, I'm in a kumite. This is pretty cool. And then I'm like, holy fuck, I'm in a kumite. This is not really cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's it's still a funny thing to me, but... You know, I reckon um, you could take him. Probably. I just double leg him. There you go. He he walked straight into a lot of things, but He did. He did. It's a fucking shitty fighter. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about a movie. <laughs> yeah, we are, yeah, that's true. And um and I think also because we also have I know we're. I, don't, I feel like a lightweight. You know, we're we're drinking a beer finally after training. This is pretty yeah, good. like this is good beer, man. It's much better than anything you get in Australia. To be fair. No, we were talking about that. You said like there's um less carbonation in this beer though, as opposed to like yeah, a little Australian bit. beer. A little bit, yeah. It's not that noticeable now that I've drunk a few, but like one hundred percent, it's a less fizzy, less bitey on the tongue. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. But like, it it certainly much nicer. It goes down smoother. It does. And, uh, yeah, I'm I'm spoiled. Even Amer- well, if you want to call some American beer beer at that, but. <laughs> Bud Light. Bud I Light is those, not I a... love those ads, man. Fuck. No, like... you, you know what made Bud Light good? And this is like, I think there's a reason they stopped showing these ads after uh, John Jones, you know, because Bud Light sponsors the UFC. Yep. Right? And for a while, they had the John Jones ad of like, there's a picture of him holding a Bud Light with Dana White. Yep. And at the bottom, it says, please drink responsibly. And this was like weeks before... John Jones wrecked his Bentley drunk driving. 
<laughs> so like Bud Light's a good party beer. Bud Light's a real good like you know. Oh, that's like amazing. I'm kind of dehydrated. Let's let's move on to something else, beer. But um, I want to at least set something straight with the listeners as far as Australian beer because back in the states we have Fosters. And yeah, I mean, okay. this might be a sore subject for for the Aussies, but it's when they. The tagline for Foster's is Foster's Australian for beer. Okay. <laughs> Truth or not? Yeah. Yeah. It depends if you're rich or not, doesn't it? Like, <laughs> most people in Australia probably fucking haven't heard of Foster's because they're too busy getting pissed on Forex. You know what I mean? Foster's is like a rich man's beer in Australia. Really? Yeah. Like, anything that's not fermented donkey piss is like a rich man's beer. Wow. Not really. Australians don't care. Australians don't care. They drink anything, anything at all. As long people as people after my done. own heart, damn. Yeah, like, that's, that's like this. What we're drinking now? What do yeah. you call it? Das Hell. Das Hell. This would be like exotic, man. Yeah. This is exotic <laughs> beer, and people would fucking murder each other for this in Australia. Wow. Um, but yeah, Foster's is pretty popular. I would say. Do you know what I mean? At least it is for where I am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't really speak for 27 million people. It's probably like a few Australians <laughs> saying, shut the fuck up. What? Especially like people that know me, that know yeah. that I don't drink that much. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, you're a dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's understandable. So like, uh, you know, back home we have all the the big ones. You know, you got your cores, you got your Bud, you got your Miller. It's of just, course. just all depends. And it's just... 100%. Like um, now the, the big thing in... Uh, in the states is craft beer. Yeah, okay. So everybody loves craft beer. Everybody gets real fucking pretentious about it too. Like, of course, because it's a pretentious beer. It is. It's, oh, I'm crafting beer. <laughs> <laughs> this one has been mixed. Um, it's part pumpkin, right? And it's been a. Uh, it's been aged in an old. Uh, uh, oh shit! I can't remember. Like it, an old, it, an old uh, mortar round. It's from been poured off the one. black rock that we used to use for peeing on. <laughs> And then it has mushroom (laughs) stewing in it for three and a half weeks, no more, no less. (laughs) But the thing is, though, like, for the amount of people that come over to my house and, like, get something to drink, like, the short fridge we have here is just, like, fair game to anybody who comes over. Of course. I might just start brewing beer myself, but keep it real simple because it's... You should put beer in that water cooler of yours. That would actually be a good idea. Like, I reckon that would be a good idea. It's what, 18, like five gallons? Five gallons. Five gallons, 18.9 liters thereabouts. Of beer. Yeah, of beer in a, in a water cooler. And you just press the tab, it flows out, and you're sorted. Done. I'd you probably, gotta do it. I'd be the most popular dude out here, probably. Look, you can even like brew your own beer in those five gallon drums. You could. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're not, gonna, <laughs> so you're not gonna lose carbonation when you like pour the beer into it. Yeah, it's no, already in there. Not. Yeah, it's just seal it off and just yeah. hit the tat. Wow. Do it. Like, real. I charge you, sir. All right. I charge you to brew beer in a five gallon drum and put it in your water cooler. Joseph's is going to kill me. You know that, right? It's like, what the, the fuck, fuck are you doing? Like, well, I'm making beer in a, in a Culligan cooler. Just like, blame me. She hates me anyway. <laughs> she does not. I told you, she said, she said that, um, I like Joshua because he's the only person I've met so far that gives it back as much as I give it. Words. I words. Words. That needs some context. Yeah. We're talking about banter here. <laughs> yeah, we're, um, you know what? I'm, I'm not into that whole thing. <laughs> yeah, we're not swinging. We're Josh, not swinging. you're a good guy. I just like to watch. Is that cool? Yeah. Like, I'm behind the closet and you do your thing and uh, <laughs> tie I'll film a tie it around your neck. Yeah. <laughs> Looking through the closet slats. <laughs> yeah, this, it's like, this is really good, but Rob's breathing. Fuck me, that's getting distracting. <sighs> Josh, go slower. <sighs> no, it's... <laughs> Did I mention this podcast is not edited, and it's definitely not for... We this actually is, ha- we this actually, is not suitable for work. We actually did have a um, a guy ask to have his 10-year-old son on the show oh, to no. be interviewed. And I was like, what the fuck, man? Like, have you ever listened to an episode of this, have of this you, podcast? Do you want him to lose his innocence and or virginity? Uh, well, well, whatever, man. He's like, well, he... So, so that's the thing too. Like, I know there's a lot of kids out there. They're super, super, super talented. Yep, some of killers out there. Yeah, like um Benjamin the other day gave him his green belt. Oh right? yeah, or Brandon. Brandon. Yeah, Brandon. yeah. Sorry, that's close enough. It's B name. Yeah, it's close enough for agriculture. Yeah. So yeah, like, right? you know, there's um, 
I don't know how it is in Australia, but the states seem to be like, if your kid starts getting good jujitsu, yep. the most popular thing to do is to whisk him up or her, make a GoFundMe account for them, yeah, and pimp them out to every and anybody you can, like company wise. Um, look, I'm not sure how your sponsors work in America, but because jujitsu is such a small scene, we have like the major company Hyperfly. Yeah. And basically what happens is as soon as you start doing well, like even remotely well, win like 10 comps in a row sort of thing, they'll give you a sponsorship. Oh, wow. That's Pretty much. Cool. Like, I'm not sure how that works because I'm shit and I don't win. Um, <laughs> but like... <laughs> Stop. You're really good. You are really good there. Thank like... you. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Um, uh, like... Yeah, I don't know how that works exactly. I'm assuming that they get in contact with you because they have your name and the contact details through the AFBJJ, yeah. um, which is like a substitute of the IBJJF. Yeah. Um, and then they'll like send you an email or whatever and say, look, we want to sponsor you. Keep going to competitions, wear our, wear our gear, and then like maybe if you do well, we'll send you overseas. Sort wow. of thing. Um, other than that, I'm not really sure how you go about getting sponsorships because it's not that big a sport in Australia yet. Just, it would be much bigger in America due to the UFC. Do you know what I mean? You, actually, you'd be surprised. What you I? really would. Straight pure jiu-jitsu is not as popular as UFC. Okay. And the reason being is because, you know, um, the worst place, in my opinion, to watch a UFC is like a place like Hooters. Oh, I fucking hate watching UFC at the pub. Yeah, it's it's the same oh. it's the same exact thing. You've got how many experts? Oh who yeah, have never ever done a Ta- combat sport. I wouldn't have tapped. Fuck off! It's like, you don't even get in the ring, you fat useless motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Just, I think you're gonna win the. You're probably gonna win an award on this podcast <laughs> for the best accent and best use of. Uh, foul language on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to or not, but like... No, you can. You can say Whatever, we'll go huge. Yeah. We'll go huge. No, we're a podcast. We don't, we don't edit potty words. Yeah, okay, good. Say. Good. Because like, guys, just just like, this is an unpopular opinion, but if you don't know what you're talking about, shut up. Yeah. Like, genuinely. It's okay to enjoy it. It's okay to have an idea, but like, as soon as you start saying shit like, oh, you know, it's not that hard. I could do it. When you haven't actually done it, if you haven't actually given it a go and you don't understand what it actually takes, shh. Yeah. Just, like, that's going to cause probably a lot of hate, but I'm of the opinion that, like, if your opinion is not actually valid, it shouldn't be weighted as equally as someone who is. So, your opinion on UFC shouldn't be as weighted as equally as, like, Fatal or Conor McGregor or... Uh, even Ronda Rousey or Dana White, yeah? Yeah. Mine shouldn't be weighted as equally. You know, I tried the whole striking scene and I figured that, you know, it would be fun to get get in and give it a go and have a few rough rounds with the lads and then I got kicked in the head. And man, was that rough. Yeah. <laughs> like, that hurt. And I thought, you know what? Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah. And I gave it another go just for like giving it a go, the good old college try, as you yeah. Americans say. And then I got kicked in the ribs. Ooh. And then I got kicked in the head again. And I thought, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. And, you know, like it. I can't watch it at the pub. I can't watch it at the pub anymore because you've got too many people that don't even train jiu jitsu. They've never even, you know, they don't even go running. They. <laughs> <laughs> They sit on the couch and they think they know and they have like an expert opinion on it and they just don't know. Um, and it, 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 I just can't watch it anymore because like, you know, Connor versus Diaz won. He got choked out and he tapped out and so many people said, oh, I wouldn't have tapped out, I would have gone out. Well, until you've been to the point of exhaustion and you've got someone as good as Nate Diaz on your back choking you, pressure in through your lungs and you can't breathe and everything's going dark... And you've already, you're in pain because you've been hit in the face, you've been kicked, you're in there alone, they've got no support, no friends, nothing else matters, no one's shouting at you, you can't hear them at all. And then you're getting choked and you're tired and all you want to do is give up. Man, tapping out seems like a good option to me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Especially if you're going to go out, especially if the fight's over and you're not. No shame. It's no shame at all. Like, he's... Conor McGregor in that situation was better than 
99.99999% of the population. The guys that didn't get in the octagon. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's and why like, I absolutely hate it. Is what like going to as an absolute last resort. Yeah, of I course. will go. I'll be like, fuck. Like, yeah. Anybody else want to see the fight? No, I'm busy. Or blah blah blah. Like, yeah, all right, of well, course. Like two of us. Like, Grant, I don't want to spend sixty sixty dollars to go. Like, yeah. Go. We'll go to whatever and sit down. And I remember the last time I watched something. It was um a. It was like a. It was like a Hooters. It yeah, was of in, course. Um, this small town, Sierra Vista, Arizona, where I trained for a bit. Sure. And um, it was Misha Tate versus um, Holly Holm. Okay. So, like, a pretty no, good no, fight no, no, then. No, 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 I take that back. It was Misha Tate versus Amanda Nunez. Okay, so pretty and, good you know, fight still anyway. Yeah, yeah, and she got choked out, right? Yeah. Or she got submitted. And this dude, like, comes fucking waddling out of the, you know, like, bathroom area. Yeah. Like, looks like he's never thrown a good punch in his life. Yep. Probably has never gone to the ground for anything. Yep. And he goes... Man, bitch, you got knocked the fuck out. And I'm like, she got submitted. What the fuck? It's just fuck. It's a pet peeve. It's a pet peeve of every martial artist yeah. that's worth his salt. And like probably some white belts still do this, but it comes back to that whole defending your thing. And yeah, like yeah. once you start training and you start understanding the martial art a bit more and you, you've been in those situations where it's really uncomfortable and you've mat-tapped, I've mat-tapped before, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I yeah. mat-tapped just the other day. Um, there's no shame in me admitting that I, I gave up because I got scared in the role. I got tired, I was pushed to my limits, I was being smothered, I felt like I was drowning. Um, and it's so easy to take the option of just, <laughs> okay, I've yeah. had enough. And you know what, I got yelled at for it by my coach, and I haven't done it again, um, but like it, I, I have no shame in admitting, you know, like I got scared and I gave up because it is scary. Yeah. And that is so much worse when you're getting hit in the face, when you're getting elbowed in the face, when you're getting axe kicked in the leg, you know, you're taking shots and it hurts. Um, and you know, like I had someone that wasn't really trying to hurt me, you know, in the octagon, it's a fight. They're trying to hurt you. They're getting paid to hurt you. And you don't have anyone, like, even though you're getting refs in the corner, it refs in the cage and your, your coach is in the corner backing you and you've got your fans in the crowd, when you're in there, you're alone. Yeah. You're alone. And it's probably, I've, I can't speak for this personally because I've never done it. I've never done it. I've never had the guts to do it. Probably one of the scariest things people can ever do. Yeah? Honestly, wasn't that bad, dude. Wasn't that bad? It was not that bad. Okay. But but I understand where you're coming from because the thoughts of it, like yeah, of course, the thoughts going up to, I was like, this dude's gonna try to punch me in the face. Like everything's legal. Like it, it was a pro fight. It was everything yeah, okay. was legal. And then I got in there and I'm like, oh shit! Like it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah, but okay. I also was not put out into deep water like some of these other people. Were. Yeah, of like, course. It was. Well, like what happens when you go up against someone that's clearly better than you are? Yeah, and that's the thing. Like you know, I got very lucky, but. I can only imagine. You know, I also can't... Mm. Like, for, for a first experience, it was not that bad. Yeah, of course. Really, it was really good. Well, that's the same way with me and rolling, isn't it? Like, I go up against some black belts and some brown belts that I'm better than. Yeah. And I don't feel too bad. And then I go up against the guys that train directly under Hodger Gracie and I just get mauled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is... Okay. I understand now. Yeah. And I think, it's, you know, like you said, mindset thing and... Like, but then again, you add punching into it. Yeah, like, of at course. the end of the day, unless a person's a real asshole, I know I'm not going to walk away. Or, or just a fluke, like a, a freak accident. Like, I'm not going to walk away injured. I'll walk yeah. away sore. That's completely yeah, of course. different. 100%. But 100%. when you start punching people in the face, then now you're... I think that probably gets different when you get up to, like, the top tier. Yeah. Because you need to want to hurt people to be at the top tier, yeah. don't you? You need to understand that it's a very real possibility that people like Polaris will just break my arm. Yeah. Um, like, you know what I mean? Even in jujitsu competition. Yeah, of like, course. He doesn't that's, give a shit. Uh, that's why I'm scared of competitions. Like, again, no shame really? in winning it. Yeah, I, wow. I, I, I'm scared of competitions because I like my body. I like being able to walk properly. I don't like the idea of being knee-barred and, like, people just wrenching it on because I don't care. You know, it 
very rare to happen. How many people go competing versus how many injuries happen. Yeah. Versus how many matches are had in the day. It's probably a very low percentage of injuries, but it doesn't stop the fear, does it? No. I mean, um, it's always present. And you know what? That's what makes people that do compete greater than I am. Even if they're a lower rank and a lower skill, it just makes them greater than I am. It's always like it's always in the back of the head. And I, I I think like uh, sometimes it's like a self fulfilling prophecy. Oh, one hundred percent. Like you know, you 100%. go in there and you're super scared because this guy could hurt you, and, and then you end up getting hurt. Yeah, yeah. and then it, it becomes like a a learnt environment. <laughs> the dog just came in. How does your dog know how to open a door? I don't know, man. Like when we got him. We got him, and he was like, uh, they say a couple things, like, hey, you know, he's a motherfucker, he's doing it again. Oh, you want to come in? You want to be a part of this? Come on. <laughs> hey, dog. Fucking dog, man. Here, I'll move the guitar out. But, like, no, cool. we, sorry, I got to get back to the, uh, got to get back to the microphone. So when we got him, like, uh, they're just like, hey, you know, he's a, he's a, a a wild dog he yep. has too much energy the only thing he wants to do is you know we don't give him a lot of water because then he'll just pee in the house we don't give him a lot of food because then he'll just poop in the house and that seems a bit silly yeah well i was like what if i just you know threw you out of this window like that'd be cool too right yeah he's a smart dog so you know well he knows how to open a door he's, he's like a and he did it twice <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just learns no 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 i'm i'm uh i'm still sweaty from training you're gonna get fair on me good dog you sit down there so, but i love you man yeah love, love you joshua you you're a you're a very good dog yeah you sit down there good boy good boy Krieger, here's the deal you want to be part of this interview you gotta lay down good That's boy it. there we go all right so, so with um yep so what where are you going next i know we had talked a little bit about it, but I know you're, you're going to London as well. You're going yeah, to... I'm going to try... Because I'm learning French at the moment. Really? Yeah, so my brother married a French woman. Um, and they have they they have had their first child recently, and they're doing, like, the dual language. Oh, so cool. she will speak solely in French to him, and he'll speak solely in English. My brother will speak solely in English. No, that's going to sound really awkward, dog. Okay, come on. Krieger. Crate. Come on. Great. Alright. Good boy. Good, Good boy. Good boy. Um, and so he's gonna grow up learning two languages. Yeah. And I thought it would be because like my brother's wife is a, a home stay at home wife now, full time mum, uh, while my brother is going off being a doctor and like actually productive and important in society. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> um instead of getting kicked in the head for a living like yeah, I yeah. do. Um uh, I thought it would be really cool to be able to speak to my nephew. So I started learning in like January, February of this year. Not very good at speaking French at the moment. But you know, when when in Europe, you go to France, don't you? Obviously. And you there's do. apparently a really good club there, like a Gracie Baja affiliate. And it's got like 20 black belts that train all the time. Oh, and shit. like a bunch of brown belts, a bunch of, a bunch of purple belts. And I thought, well, you, you kill two birds with one stone, don't you? Also, my girlfriend wants me to go to Paris and buy her some jewelry from Europe and, like, expensive habits and makes my wallet cry. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> um... Yeah. Um, so, you know, you kill three birds with one stone, I suppose. Learn some French while you're there. You have to take the classes in French because it's uh, France, obviously. Yeah. And, uh, hopefully pick something up by the time I come home. And after that, I'll come back and we'll see how you guys are going and... Because uh, you guys say you want to be affiliated with me now for some reason. I don't know why, but, you know, there you go. Um, and then I'll I'll probably hold another grading, you know, two or three months down the track for you guys when I come back. And then I'll go to London and train solidly for one or two months. And I'll come back again. And then I'll, like, go do something else, and then I'll go home. Wow. Or I'll come back again, and then I'll go home. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, man. Yeah. That's the way it is, so... Seriously, like, um, we're very fortunate to have you here, and uh, I know Krieger's actually really excited for you to be here because, well, he broke into the room. <laughs> but, you know, with the training, and you're going to compete in the London Open too, yeah? Um, that was the plan originally. We'll see how we go. Okay. I damaged my foot a while back, yeah, yeah. and, like, it's only just started to come right. This is what I was talking about, being afraid of competitions, because yeah. at Brown Belt, toe holds are a thing, and mm. if someone sees the fact that my foot's braced or strapped... 
they'll just jump on it and they won't care. They'll wrench it, and if it pops, that's the entire trip in Europe done. Wow. So, like, that, I'll have to go home and I'll have to take six to eight months off. And to me, I would rather train hard as if I was going to compete and not compete than compete after two months and get injured and then go home. That to me, sense. to me, it's a better option to train for six months hard than it is to train for two months hard and compete, and then get hurt. Yeah, yeah. no, I I agree with that one hundred percent. You know, and that's the thing. Like, you know, a lot of weight is put into competition, but I don't 100%. feel so much as that. I've had this conversation before on the podcast. Like, does competing really have to be the end all be all grade of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Because a good example, of my like uh, my friend Rico went from four stripe purple to black not competing. Yeah, of course. And he's probably the most, one of the most annoying people I've ever had to roll with. Of course. Like, he will sing and he will make jokes, like, tell jokes, not like, oh, that was a good arm bar. Like, hey, you know, two guys walking to the bar, you know, like that type of shit and then talking a Russian accent to me while, and I'm breathing hard, like, trying to get past him. He's like, oh, it's what good is, luck. Ha ha. And then he But is arm that you me. training with him a week ago or is that you training with him when you sub me today? That was me training with him, like, uh, shit, last year? Yeah, okay. Okay. So, like, man, you're a good level purple belt. You're pushing me quite hard, and, you know, I, I'm not going to say I'm good because I'm not in comparison to anyone that actually is good. You know what I mean? Like, the top-tier black belts. But I've been described as a hard roll before by some. Oh, that's, and, that's an understatement. Oh, my God. And, um... And, you know, like, I, again, I don't want to say that I'm good because there's different tiers of good man, isn't there? Yeah. Um, but I'm all right. I'm okay at the sport. And the fact that you're, like, making me work hard and you've subbed me a few times now in our roles and, like, we have 10, 15, 20-minute roles and you're smashing the crap out of me, you've got good pressure and all the rest of it, and, like, I'm having to work hard to not lose says a lot, man. I appreciate it. says that. a lot. Thank you. Like, just quietly. <laughs> um, and for the viewers, what I meant by like a week ago versus now is that when I first came in, Rob was being nice a little bit with his roles, so he wasn't going as hard as he was. But then since we've gotten comfortable with each other um, and he's like started to know me and he's started to understand that I don't mind if he rolls hard, he started to just give it a go, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like one hundred percent, just getting into it, and I appreciate that. Actually, I like hard rolls. Me too, and and that's the thing. Like you know, like today we had uh, Bella. Like she's what eleven or something. Yeah. Like you know, next week I'll probably be like, well, sucks for you, Bella, and I'm gonna knee slice past her like real hard. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see your face there from my knee. Yeah, my bad. I oh, should have tapped. It's okay. You're only eleven. You'll get better. But like, but then... <laughs> You'll rebound. <laughs> you don't need your knees. <laughs> You're not 30 something like me. You'll be fine. Good God. Just take some ibuprofen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Walk it off. Walk it off. No, nah, but no, I do appreciate that. And, uh, you know, it's it's good to get those hard rolls in. Of course. Especially with um, like you. Of course. And, you know, uh, Jesus, John. Yeah. It's a tr- oh, he's a behemoth. Jesus, yeah. that's what it is. He's like, he's probably six foot tall. Um, Now, I'm a big dude. Like, I, I don't know if you have a primarily American audience or not. Oh, uh, yeah, primarily. Yeah, okay, so I'm 93 kilos, which is like 210 pounds, and this guy dwarfs me. Yeah. Like, I, I will use all of my body to try and pull him down in my clothes guard, and he'll, with one hand, he'll push on my chest and just, like, rear up. You know you know what he looks like? The yep. best description. Do you ever see that comic of the, like... Guy jumping on the like the the yoked blue belt and he's like that's it use your use yeah, your yeah 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 that's what he yeah, looks like that's what he looks like Jeez, yeah, he's huge perfect. well he's, he's a big like stereotypical fucking army jock isn't he yeah damn near like he is the definition of the American hero is <laughs> 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 like big fuck off built like a brick shit house unit with a square jaw and like shaved buzz cut head and he yeah, just yeah. like. Um, has, like, the thickest accent I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> like, not South accent, but, like, just thick Northern accent. Yeah, yeah. And he, he's like, I never thought that I would meet a walking, living, breathing stereotype. But there he is. 
<laughs> yeah, and he's he's, he's, he's so he's, amazing though. He's so yeah, amazing. He's, he's a good like, dude. I enjoy rolling with him. Also. Yeah, I, I like rolling with him. He was a hard roll. Yeah. I um felt something go on my back today when I was rolling. With oh him. Jesus! Um, yeah, that, that goes back to the whole like we don't want that trip to be over. Yeah, here. of course. It was a good roll though. Like it was hard. It's good to get experience with different body types. Like that's why I like rolling with women a lot of the time. Yeah. Your dog wants Jesus, out. He's, he I, is incredible. Come on. He is oh, actually no. incredible. Sorry about this, guys. It, no, it, no. It was, uh, that well, was if, amazing. If the, if the people listen to the podcast, I know I got two dogs. One of them has yeah, of a course. key and everything, so it's okay. One hundred percent. Um, I can't remember what I was saying. Oh yeah, di- rolling different body types. You, a lot of people when they start jujitsu and when they continue jujitsu, will have like five or six really good training partners that they enjoy rolling with that will push them. Yeah. Um, or that they can beat. And they, but they, because they can beat them, the training partner is of the mindset like, oh, I'm having a good roll because I'm getting beaten, yeah. but like not hurt. And so you'll keep training with these like five or six people, sometimes two or three. Um, at home, I have uh, a guy called Dan Castles and Jake Trindle that used to train together all the time. Right. And they would literally just roll together all the time. And so their stars have very much progressed together, but like they struggled a fair bit when they'd roll against heavier guys or smaller guys again, um, they they both only weigh like 70 kilos, which is 150 pounds yeah, sort of thing. They're small dudes. Um, but like they never rolled against the guy that weighs 110 kilos. Understandably. I don't like rolling against those people because I find them hard work. I find them <laughs> scary, frankly. Um, but, you know, I force myself to because rolling with people of all different body types will get you better at jiu-jitsu. Yeah. You have to learn how to deal with that. Um, and it makes you more well-rounded on the whole. That's why I like rolling with smaller people as well, especially women, because I can't put all my weight down because it would just hurt them. Yeah. I know that sounds really sexist, but, like, I'm a big dude. Um, 200 pounds is not light. No. Um, it's really not especially like, the way you do it man. yeah God yeah damn. yeah like my whole style of jiu-jitsu is pressure centric so I put all of my weight down in certain points and it makes it just horrible to move under me um, side note you were doing that really well today oh thank you actually really really well like annoyingly so um, and so like as a result if I'm if I'm rolling with a, a chick that weighs 110 pounds like you know you crush her ribs <laughs> so you have to learn how to move yourself around them um, and maneuver around them and often some of my hardest roles were actually with wider women wow um, just because I like I'm having to tone it down to the point where like I'm not hurting them but also keeping up with their skill which is quite difficult because I roll with some girls that are really good like really good and so like there's always the trade off of oh do I be a bit of a dick here or do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so as exactly a result, either. I have to use like 100% technique. Uh, it gets me better at jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Mm. And and those are my favorite rules too. Yeah, for sure. Like, I like getting the shit beat out of me, but... After a while, it gets a bit old. It does, yeah. It does. Go six months without a, like a single sub and you start to like question your validity as a person, don't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a stupid sport. Why the fuck? Why <laughs> well, I'm paying people money to do this. Like, yeah, what like, the hell? Why am I paying to get choked and hurt and unlocked and yeah, broken? It's, it's not... I don't know. I could just like be a real human and not do exercise. Nah, like, that's, that's boring. That's, that's why we have like TV and cars. So we don't have to actually like do effort. Why not do everything? Exactly. That's not a bad idea, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. So, <laughs> so before we head out, Joshua, um, I know you wanted to plug a couple things before uh, we finished yep. up the podcast. So, four is yours. Go nuts, man. Yeah, sure. So, guys, like I have a uh, an exercise apparel business called Fat Lead Apparel. Now, um, the way that I started this is my mom was overweight when yeah. she first started the, her exercise. And uh, she never had the confidence to set foot in the gym. Right. She always thought she would get laughed at by like the gym junkies, the fit, fitter people in there. And obviously, that never actually happens. Some of like the nicest people go to gym, and they're the most supportive of overweight people trying to get going. Never stopped the fear, did it? So what I did, being like a purple belt at the time, was I said, "Mom, look, I'll go to gym with you. If anyone says anything to you or sniggers or something, they'll have me to talk to. I promise you, it will not go well for them." It will not be a good time. And 
obviously I would never hurt anyone or even like start anything, but because I know that people are never like that, but to her, it emboldened her to the point where she could go. So I went with her pretty much every day for eight or nine weeks until she knew enough people, she knew enough exercises, she had lost enough weight to go alone. And it got me thinking, what about, like, everyone else that doesn't have someone like me? What happens with, like, overweight people that really want to start, but just don't because of self-confidence issues? So I came up with Fat Lead Apparel, Fat Athlete, yeah, as, yeah. like, large-fitting, comfortable exercise shirts. You've seen them, yeah. obviously. I'm wearing one right now. Lovely. Um, and you've had a, had a bit of a look at the shirts. What did you think of them? I think they're really cool, man. Yeah, I do cool. like them. Um, and the idea was, like, just to get in first, have a bit of a laugh and say, look... I know I'm overweight, I know I, I could probably be a bit fitter, but you know what, I'm here, I rocked up, I stepped through the door, what up? And um, so like the idea was to have really high quality, good shirts that were just a bit funny, yeah. do you know what I mean? So if you, if you guys are interested in that, um, unfortunately we don't have much more than just eight different types of shirts, both in men and in women's, because I started it on five grand at uni. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, so like if I was going to do like a, a, a trial run for every single design that I had and every color I wanted to do and every size, it was going to cost me like 40 grand. Yeah. Um, t-shirts are nuts, man. T-shirts are nuts when you want to get it going. So I was thinking, oh, whatever we get a bit of support, then we'll add to it. So the idea is to add like, um, more clothing, shorts, shoes, shirts, uh, not shirts, sorry, socks, uh, caps, etc eventually um so if you if you like the idea of that guys head on over to fatleet.com.au look there's an american that copied it and said his brand is fatleet clothing or something like that so don't be fooled by fatleet.com it's fatleet f-a-t-l-e-t-e dot com dot au do we gotta go fuck that dude up yeah i own the um i own the copyright to fatleet so like I'll send him a cease and desist notice. Yeah. And if he doesn't, then I guess we'll like go break his kneecaps. Yeah. No. Not really. <laughs> oh no! Allegedly, we will allegedly do something. We will. We will send in the, the the killer drones of lawyers. Yeah. There you go. And they will hypothetically break his kneecaps. Or no, <laughs> hang on. Not hypothetical. It's um, parable, something like that. I have like, no idea. Like. I, I don't even know we've what managed to, to avoid getting sued so far we've, so we're we've, doing we've good, avoid right? getting yeah. sued so far if you get sued because of me I'm not sorry because that's an achievement no I'm cool with it like you know I, I, I like a little controversy with my uh, podcast <laughs> I've already gotten banned from a BJJ web, dating website and, oh yeah yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell that story after this like but. W- when did you what were you what were you telling me about before you got in trouble with uh, some sort nah. of magazine that's off. Uh, that's offline. That was kind of an agreement with somebody else too. Well, I'll. T- <laughs> yeah, man, we're uh, we're pretty controversial. Not really controversial. We just enjoy. We have fun, you. We have fun. and that's all that matters. Like, and I that's fucking love it. like, you just need to have fun with life, don't you? Yeah, and not take things too seriously. Because if you do, you just end up fucking angry, and yeah. uh, it's just retarded. Probably shouldn't say that because someone will get upset. It's but whatever. like, and it's you just... know what? They can write an email to the contact on the web page at bigjujitsu.com dot com, and uh, then <laughs> I'll read it and laugh and ignore it. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, that's yeah, guys. Fatleadapparel dot com, not fatleadapparel. Fatleat dot com dot au. Hell yeah, fatleat dot com dot au. Cool, Joshua. Thanks so much for being on the show, man. You're I really very do appreciate welcome. it. You're very very welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, train with you for the week it's been a pleasure what well, I was going to say man when you come back again oh, well, yeah. we got, I've extended we got... my stay fuck yeah like I'm here for another week now so uh, we'll figure out what to do from there and then I'll come back in two week, uh, two, months. two months excellent we'll have you back on sounds good alright Joshua thanks again man no, no stress at all my friend <laughs>